Welcome to the Grace Hour, a daily program. We're going to take you into uh, some of the issues that affect your life as a believer, the challenges, and we want you to learn more about your faith in a practical way. My name is Pastor Steve Andrelonis. I'm joined with Pastor Jason Moore here in the studio, located at uh, Greater Grace Church in Baltimore. And uh, we're talking about a a specific topic uh, this week, uh, the doctrine of suffering. And uh, we're going to focus on uh, on some things that you can read, in particular a book uh, that came out uh, late 60s, early 70s, called Tortured for Christ. And uh, this book was written by a uh, Lutheran pastor, a Jewish man, married to a Jewish woman who was an atheist, but then was converted and, and became a Lutheran pastor in Romania. And then uh, as Romania capitulated to the communist rule in uh, the late 40s after World War II, Romania had its Nazi occupation time, and then after that it had its uh, communist takeover, basically. And Richard Warmbrandt was uh, taken and put into prison, uh, you know, and uh, Tortured for Christ, uh, this book, I can show you this, Tortured for Christ, this book, uh, has uh, touched a lot of people, and uh, Pastor Warmbrandt uh, died in uh, 2001, uh, but uh, he spent a lot of time uh, sharing his experiences as a prisoner of, uh, for his faith. And so Pastor Jason and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, how this book uh, would affect you, uh, persecution. Uh, perhaps you've never really experienced uh, the kind of persecution uh, resisted in the faith uh, to the point of uh, shedding your blood. And so we're going to talk about this. We have a conversation about this book and about how this book, it's been made into a movie also uh, in recent years. Voice of the Martyrs uh, is an organization uh, that Pastor Wormbrand founded with a, uh, I think, a $100 and 500 names on a mailing list. And in that those days, you, you literally mailed the newsletter uh, with envelopes and everything like that. Now, of course, things come to your inbox. But and I think his his son Michael still runs an organization, although they're not he's not affiliated with the Voice of the Martyrs at this point. But um, uh, but this is you know this is the the kind of book that um, you know really uh, what it does something does something to your heart and mind when you read it. Would you like to share yeah. something, Pastor Jason? Just yeah, Pastor Steve, I was I'm just blessed to be here with you and the listening audience. Just. This book, I haven't looked at it in years, and I, I read through it, and I watched the movie, and it just affected me just in a fresh way. I think as Christians, we can get comfortable and uh, just kind of forget maybe that there are people that are suffering for their faith, and it, it helped me. Uh, it sobered me up in the sense of just being thankful to put my trials and my situations into perspective. And I think if you, if, if you read this book, it will help you put your life into perspective a little bit. Mm. Um, you know, some things that really stood out. I mean, there's some great quotes I'd like to focus on at some point, but the suffering church, the persecuted church, um, one quote that Wormbrandt says is that there are no lukewarm members in the suffering church in the underground church. And when you think about that takeover that happened in 1944, uh, it's interesting how the communists uh, approached the churches in Romania. They seduced the church, first of all, by offering the leaders more money. They uh, looked, they, they took over and they wanted to have like this relationship where uh, we could work together. The only thing that they asked was to change what they believed in. So they seduced the church and then the narrative of compliance was a big deal in 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 that day and it still is today in in some subtle ways and then they began to control and monitor the churches because what they cannot uh control they feared or that unknown of what the church was uh propagating they knew that if they could get a hold of the church then then they could get a hold of the masses they could have a message to the masses so that control led to illegal bibles uh illegal meetings um and if you read through this book and other books that you have there 
um, you can see that they look like they're your friend at first. You know, they mm -hmm. they come in with all these uh, niceties, but their objective is to control and to establish atheism. Because most communist governments, their communal uh, perspective is uh, there is no God. Atheism mm -hmm. is the point of reference, um, and they attack or they uh, they go after anything that where they could lose control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just maybe I could say one other thing too. Just when you read through this book, you really get a perspective of the suffering mm -hmm. of those that suffer. I mean, each one of us has our trials and tribulations, so this is not meant to diminish anything you're going through. <laughs> But I really saw this in a fresh light that knowing, knowing the perspective of those that suffer really deepens our faith. Yeah, the, uh, the uh, what was I going to say, the uh, sense of persecution, uh, the kind of, uh, the relation, the relating to the kind of uh, suffering that they had to do, uh, you know, um, you know, them, uh, this, uh, this, uh, you know, the communist, uh, their thinking was that the creation of a, a just and equitable human society requires that everyone focus on the horizontal, the here and now. And this is like, okay, churches can exist for a period of time until we start to indoctrinate them with this idea. And so the idea of being this this lie that's perpetuated that you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. This is really what the communists wrote over uh, their efforts to silence the Christian witness because their idea was that, you know, if the Christian is participating in Bible study, Bible reading, worship services, then he is not participating in the workers paradise that they are trying this is it this is all you have everyone needs to be involved in this for the sake of equal human society and so yeah. that's the way that they portrayed it and uh, you know when they bring this to the churches what we want is a more just society uh, but i think like you know you've been in uh, ukraine and uh, poland right did you yeah. live in both these so both of those were just ukraine but i just but you lived it there so uh, that part of the world is still uh, recovering from, you know, it's been 1990. 1989 was the first real breakthrough with this, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then, of course, uh, that part of the world opened up uh, as it had not been opened for uh, decades uh, from, you know, in the Soviet Union, for example, in the 20s, and then on through World War II, and then uh, through uh, you know, and of course, communist governments still exist in at least uh, strong forms in three places: North Korea, uh, Cuba, and um, China. You know, and uh, we know uh, we can we know the kind of persecution. So uh, to read a book like this, to open this book. Now, the thing we should tell you is like uh, Richard Wormbrand is kind in this. He spends yeah. the first couple chapters. Uh, talking about the kind of suffering that was there, the kind of abuse that was heaped upon them, the kind of, uh, you know, denial of food, the kind of uh, torturous punishment that was inflicted on them, the, the attempt to get them to uh, expose the underground church. That was really the reason for the torture, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you use a good word, kindness. Like, that's one thing that's uh, so obvious like he loved the russian people i mean mm -hmm. imagine living in a country a million russians are occupying your country uh you're you're you can be obviously upset angry hatred could really be the be the ingredient that you fight with every day but richard wormbrandt really from god he learned a lot of the russian language just to minister to the people and to he had pity on them that yeah. atheism that you're an atheist well you, in so many words, you have no one to thank. You have mm -hmm. no one to worship. And he says this. He says, um, you know, you can kill the body, but you cannot kill our love. <laughs> I mean, again, he just really had this incredible love 
he'd received this love from God and was able to love his enemy. And you see all throughout the book, even before he's captured, and then while well, and he stands up, it, this is really amazing. In the beginning part of the book, he stands up in front of all of these other churches where the communist leaders are talking and seducing them with more money and like work with us, we'll work with you and just. And he gets up and he and he just declares his faith and glorifying Christ and that he serves only one, uh, one God. And that catalyst that after that meeting, after that declaration, he was taken away. Yeah. And um, his ministry became 14 years in the prisons, um, as we've said, ministering, doing Bible studies. And he said, he said, I've worked out an agreement with the guards. You beat me, and I preach the gospel. <laughs> you beat us, and we preach the gospel and um that's quite a that's quite a thought yeah uh <laughs> now the thing interesting thing he i don't know if he mentions it in this book he does maybe he does um uh he mentions that um he mentions that uh, he was taken captive he was arrested on february 29th 1948 yeah. which is uh, he remembers the date very well and uh, he said in a couple of, it's kind of interesting, uh, here at Greater Grace, uh, we have a history with this, with Richard Wernbrand and the Wernbrand family. Um, uh, Richard Wernbrand spoke uh, here in Baltimore a couple of times. In fact, a week before I was married, uh, he was speaking in the very church that my wife and I got married, Hamilton Presbyterian Church over on Harford Road here. Hmm. Uh, he, we, we got together with that church. We were a, uh, uh, we were a church, uh, the Bible speaks in Baltimore led by, uh, pastor Steve Duff at that time. We had Richard Wormbrand there and we enjoyed that. And, uh, and he came and appeared here and, uh, after our ministry, greater grace was established here in Baltimore. He appeared, uh, he was here speaking, but he, I remember him talking about this, uh, February 29th. It's important because he makes the point that in, in the translation of the Bible that he read, uh, fear not appears, or do not be afraid appears 366 times. One for every day of the year, and even one for the leap year. Yeah. So this is like a, a big thing. And if you're reading some of the Christmas stories now, and you're watching our podcast, our talk here, and uh, you're reading some of the Christmas stories, you know that fear not is, uh, is a part of the Christmas story. Fear not, Mary, uh, the child, You'll be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. You've found favor with God. Fear not, Joseph, to take Mary as your wife. And then Richard Wormbrand said, fear not, appears in the Bible so many times. So this was the kind of a, the scriptural meditation that he managed. That's, that's one thing we should say. When you read the book, you don't get the gory details yeah. only. You also get like a, a good sense of what kept him in those, in those situations. And then... Uh, be prepared because you know he puts the finger on the Western world, right? He does. He does. Uh, before we go there, I just think of one thing he said. He said, "God doesn't judge us for what we have endured, but how we love." Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real capstone for the whole book, because I mean, he he talks about meeting with other prisoners and they have these shackles, these chains, and they're banging their chains and they use that as music mm -hmm. for their songs. I mean. I mean that just the depth of this, the boldness, the conviction, the the uh, value they put on the Word of God and their time together. Um, they had agreed that okay, I'm going to die, but before I die, there's going to be uh, there's going to be a ministry. There's going to be a ministry to the guards. I mean, I think of another story. He's there praying. the The guard looks in on him. And he sees Richard Wormbrandt there praying, and he opens the door, starts yelling at him, saying, why are you praying? You have nothing left. Your wife's in jail. Your, your family is gone, and everything's stripped away. He says, who are you praying for? And he says, I, he, says, I was, he looked up, and he looked at the guard, and he said, I was praying for you. And the guard just gets quiet and retracts from the cell, closes the door. Like, his ministry was one of love and that love and truth and that love in um that love that was based in in uh, in god's mind and god's heart um you know you mentioned earlier about the ukraine um <clears throat> the ukraine our church was in a region called Pidzamcha, and it was it's a place where 140,000 jews were, were murdered for their faith and um 
in this Jewish ghetto, they call it. Our church was there, and um, that was something we we saw like it was a monument and very much mm-hmm. real, um, and something to be remembered because history repeats itself if it's not honored or learned from. And uh, in the Ukraine in particular, we see through World War II that it was run over by the Russians and then run over by the Germans. And then there's a lot of um, pain and suffering even today with the present situation uh, that, uh, that really we need, they need our prayers. But we see that, you know, you quote, no fear that Psalm 56, three, he quotes that, that I am afraid, but I will not fear. I will trust in you. So I think fear can be easily understood, right? You're there, mm-hmm. you're not eating, you're drugged, you're beaten, you're threatened, you're coerced. And again, we haven't experienced that in the West. No, we haven't had that limit. That, we haven't been pushed to that edge or those limits <laughs> yet. We haven't resisted unto blood right. so much. Yeah. But he says there in page 80, he says that the, the, the West is asleep. And I think that's their challenge with all the prosperity and blessings that we have, and we have them because of the goodness of God, um, that the church has what it has, not to for itself, but to give it away, to reach out to soul win. And, and, and Richard Wormbrandt says that, he says that one of the objectives of the underground church is that he would make each convert a soul winner. Uh, prayer was his only escape. And, uh, more than his own life, he valued the Bible. I mean, these are things that we as Christians, we have maybe 10 Bibles at home, right? We have... Uh, at least, yeah, maybe we, a variety of trans, 10 different translations there. <laughs> what do you got, 70 on your phone? Maybe it's more than that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's 270 nowadays. You can only pick your iPhone out. You can pick whatever translation you want. There you go. I mean, we, we have it in excess and... He, he says there's two types of Christians, and I love this too. I'm quoting a lot from this because I got a lot out of it. He says there are two types of Christians, those that sincerely believe in God, and then number two, those that sincerely believe that they believe. Mm. So, I mean, I think the second one, it could be really, that's a, that's a sobering thought. Like, do I believe in God? Therefore, if I believe in God, then love is in my ministry. Hunger is in my attitude. So in the West, um, I believe in the United States, people say the United States has been evangelized. I say right now the world has come to our nation. We have a huge, amazing opportunity to to minister in our country, and it's very open. It's exceptionally open. Uh, And we have to wake up the Christians, I think. Mm -hmm. I know I need that. Complacency, Mm -hmm. comfortability, comfortable with the uncomfortable, you know, these things, we need we need iron sharpens iron. We need something that's going to wake us up to spiritual realities. So. so the point, you know, the point of him writing this book was to give like sort of an, an accurate record of his his life in, in the prison system and uh, the lengths that they went to to try and um, silence the witness and create again this is all designed because of the uh, uh, the kind of society that they thought that they were shaping for the world just um, you know it just was you know it just goes back to the writings of Karl Marx actually mm. Richard Warmbrandt read it, wrote a series of books uh, one of them was uh, uh, about the Satanism the subtle and uh, somewhat blatant Satanism that uh, was involved in the life of Karl Marx, you know, Marxism, and then this idea of, uh, a, you know, Marxist atheist economic activity. This is like, um, you know, as we could see like through uh, the way that um, people think today have been affected by, you know, uh, you know, some, you know, some French philosophy, uh, very much about uh, turning, you know, yourself and uh, the full self-fulfillment, uh, and then also, uh, you know, of course, the uh, the origin of the species, this Darwinism that has, uh, you know, infected like biology and uh, academic institutions about where people came from, and then also uh, the Marxism, uh, the idea of Marxism. Uh, economically, so you have uh, one thing about uh, self-centeredness, another thing 
about um, your origin, and then the next thing about your economic life, and then of course, of course, the next part of that is uh, Sigmund Freud and uh, and his uh, his disciple, more his disciple, the guy who comes after him, talks about the the sexuality aspect of these. These things have sort of created the the storm that we see in the Western world nowadays. Is like uh, these kind of uh, these kind of uh, questions about gender, about sexuality, uh, about um, equality and justice. All of these things have been layered over the course of um, of uh, of, uh, of this a couple of centuries now. So you're talking about the 1700s, the French Revolution, and the French philosophy. And it being, you know, being, you know, uh, seen as the uh, what is it, the uh, the highest kind of thinking, and mm. this is where we've gotten to. And uh, what tortured for Christ shows is the, you know, when somebody gets to a certain level of power and has a certain amount of influence, as as it did in these nations, uh, you know, Soviet Union. Uh, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Yugoslavia. That, that was that's you know those of you who are twenty something, you might not even have remembered that that was even a country yes. at some point. But this is the, that country has split into several ethnic uh, centered countries. Um, uh, Serbia being one of them, Croatia being one of them. Uh, I forget Montenegro. Zagreb, yeah. yeah, right. So all of those were yeah. uh, were one country called Yugoslavia, and uh, you know all of them had this you know varying forms of um, you know uh, kinds of uh, communist ideology, and mm-hmm. you know as you know this, how do human beings treat each other this way? And uh, it, it wasn't new because we see that you know. The Roman government treated, you know, the early church and the people under their control the same way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you think about the, the core of communism, it, 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 it elevates man's goodness, man's communal responsibility one for another. But one major thing that they're doing is they're doing it without God. <clears throat> they're doing it without the understanding of God. So I remember in the Ukraine, we were door knocking and I met a man and, um, we spent some time with him and our conversation actually went several hours and he was a preacher in, in the, um, in the fifties and sixties, I'm sorry, in the sixties and seventies, excuse me. And he, he had a church and what would happen would, he would be asked to write his message and the KGB would look at the message to make sure that it did not reflect anything against the government, but also they would manipulate his message to have a communist undertone to Mm. the listeners. And this man was under such guilt and shame because he did it because his life was in jeopardy. And he came into our ministry and, and uh, he's now with the Lord, but um, he was so released and that's what grace does in a, in a, in a person's life. But I, I just, I just want to say this about, <clears throat> about tortured for Christ again, that, that, um, you know, Sabina was an amazing, uh, yes. amazing <clears throat> help me. She said to him, you know, in that speech, she said, you know, Richard Wormbrand said, if I say something, you're not going to have a husband. And she said, well, I want a husband that's not a coward. <laughs> so she had some spiritual grit. That that book, this book is filled with spiritual grit. And it challenges you because when you look through the history, as Pastor Steve just said, today we have a lot of communist undertones. We do. We have a lot of things. I remember talking to a young person. They had a hammer and sickle on their shirt. And I said, hey, I said, you know what? You know, just got talking with him. I said, what, what's up with your shirt there? And, you know, and he didn't even know what it was. Mm-hmm. And again, these symbols, a hammer and sickle uh, is, the, the, you know, the communist sign um, it, for Russia anyway. They, you know, they have no idea symbolism has been revised. And I think the danger we have in our day and age is that we must understand our history so that we don't repeat it because the church is being seduced today. The, the, the people are in a neo-pagan, uh, right, Pastor Steve? A neo-pagan, there's like no absolute truth. There's like all these different Baal worships going on um, and there's a lie and the lie is, and I love how Ravenville, Ravenhill, Leonard Ravenhill, he's a great, a great guy too. He said this, he's now with the Lord, a great preacher, he said, we are too busy chasing the mice while lions devour our land. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I think this book just kind of shows us what is the true reality. Well, the true reality is love. The true reality is Christ. The true reality is my Bible. My true true reality is my is heaven, and not consumption. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I can just keep going here. No, it's, <laughs> no, I think you know that's the thing. When you get towards the end of the book, you get like uh, you get Pastor Warmbrand challenging uh, the nature of. Uh, uh, complacency and uh, just thinking that this could uh, never happen in a Western society. Uh, you know, uh, so you read a book like this. I mean, how did this, you know, when Richard Warmbrand was ransomed, basically, mm-hmm. um, you know, he was, uh, he spent 14 years in this prison. Uh, two years of that was in solitary confinement. And there was another couple of years when he spent it in what was called the dying room, which means that they had drugged him, beat him so much, and his respiratory, uh, you know, they just felt like he's going to die any moment. And uh, he was put into this room with dying men. And so for two years, uh, this was an amazing ministry for him. You'll read this, like, what did he do? He, you know, he had to be turned over. He had to be, he had to have help to walk, uh, to do anything. Uh, to have his clones changed. I don't know if they were even given baths, but uh, were they allowed to wash every now and then? He needed help with all of that. Uh, But every time a new person came into the room, it was another opportunity to lead someone to Christ. And that's a big, that's the hopeful part of the book is like the Hmm. crisis that he's under, the persecution that he's under did not diminish this uh, soul winning heart that he had for the people. Yes, he's praying for communists, uh, prison guards. He's also praying for the uh, different prisoners that are dying in the room with him. And, um, you know, uh, this book was just the first of many that he wrote. Mm. Um, he wrote another book that I, that's one of my favorites. Uh, it's called With God in Solitary Confinement. And uh, the way that I got this book is um, Catonsville uh, at a church on the other side of uh, Baltimore, west side of Baltimore in Catonsville, went to a, a meeting. Uh, Richard Warmbrand was speaking. He was speaking afterwards. He's talking to people, and his wife, who's about was about four foot two, I mean, really, she was like a very small woman, but she manned the book table, and like you know, and people would buy books, and I bought a couple of books, and uh, but uh, you know, she, I, I felt this tug on my shirt, and it was her, and she had this book, and she pressed it to my chest and said, "You need this book." <laughs> and I have it here. It's like it's like sort of falling apart. I've oh, read wow. it several times now. So I got this uh, probably not early 1980s. 19, I was married already, so it must have been 1984, 85 when I got this. But she pushed this book. She said, you need this book. I said, well, I don't have but She said, you take. And then she grabbed another book and handed it to me. So I was going to buy two books. I wound up with four. But this one... <laughs> It's really interesting, uh, uh, Richard Wormbrand being alone with, uh, you know, with rats and mice and mm. insects. Uh, he would prepare every night a message to preach to his cell. And so every night it would be sermon time for Richard Wormbrand, and he would preach a sermon. And that's these are the ones that he remembered. He couldn't write anything down, so he remembered a couple of dozen of these mm. and to put them in this book. Now, here's the interesting thing. This is like very interesting story about this. Um, years later, uh, after Richard Warmbrand was um, released and he's touring the United States and Canada, he's in Canada at a meeting and talking about this book. And uh, in that in that room, in that room, there was a man who had been in jail and he heard a message in his cell. So Richard Warmbrand is in Romania preaching to the atmosphere. No one's listening. This man's in a cell in Canada and he heard the message in his cell in Canada that Richard Wormbrand preached wow. in his cell in Romania. So wow. this is like one of those like miracle kind of <laughs> stories that you know that like okay so Richard Wormbrand is all alone he doesn't think he has a ministry but the atmosphere and I was like well how can that happen and it mm. says you know well second kings tells us like there's a what is it it's uh, Elisha Elisha hears the words that you speak in your bedroom. The birds mm. carry it to him or the something. It's like, so, hey, we talk on cell phones now. Like, it's <laughs> like, you know, the the environment for 
voice to travel wirelessly existed. And so this is, you know, wow. now I've heard that story. I think it was a, a pastor in our church that told it in a, in a convention, but mm. this is, you know, this That's is a amazing. story is like Richard Warren Brand would preach. It preached one of these messages and the guy got the book and he said, I heard that message, you know, was he imagining it? I don't, you know, mm. can miracles happen? That's, I guess, a big question for you. Uh, could you be like a, a miracle believer, a believer in the Bible, and they're going to hustle you off? I don't know. I mean, uh, we, we can't that, limit God, that's we, for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, and the, the power of the devil, how how pervasive will it, be, will it come mm. uh, in the Western world? But Pastor Steve, is there a message in there I'm remembering called the beauty of nothing? I don't know if that's, I know that he preached that. I know yeah. that he preached that here. Uh, that was one of his messages that he preached here. I don't see that in this one. Yeah, if you're listening today and you are, um, maybe Google that, The Beauty of Nothing. He talks about being in the cell, having the imaginary cup and, and the bread and just doing communion in his oh, cell. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And again, the way he just kept himself, I mean, again, he says uh, in another place that you know he barely re- could speak or remember the Bible. He only remembered very few words, but one of the words was love. And um, just the way he, um, you know, it would be easy, I would imagine, to give up, to cave in, to renounce, to give the names. That's one thing I saw uh, or read as well, that the people in the underground church were very, uh, they kept their confidentialities. Mm-hmm. They, they um, It was more important for them to die with honor than to give up um, names and other people would die in the, you know, f- because of them. But again, that just the depth that Richard Wormbrandt had and the way he kept loving, everything was an opportunity to preach. And, and I would just say this, I, I go back to what was said earlier, God doesn't judge us on what we have endured, but how we love. So kind of like what are we, what is our ministry in what we're, where we're at now? What, what are we, how are we ministering in the, the condition and place that we're in? I talked with a, a lady recently here that's been struggling for months with a certain health condition, and um, it can it can eclipse you. Pain can eclipse mm-hmm. your 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 thinking in these types of things. But what a ministry you have in this place! Maybe your ministry is to God, maybe your ministry is to your family because you can't get out. Maybe your ministry is on the phone praying with somebody. Maybe your ministry is online. Um, you have a ministry, right? Mm-hmm. We have a ministry. And, you know, in this book, again, I'm just quoting off bits and pieces here, but three things that the underground church is saying to us, don't abandon us, don't forget us, and don't write us off. Don't abandon us, don't forget us, don't write us off. And Pastor Steve, you, we just had like a, a day here in Great yeah. Grace. Yeah, persecuted church. Uh, prayer for the persecuted church, early November. Yeah. Yeah. What is that, Hebrews 3.13 or 13.3 that says, maybe it's 3.13, it says, remember me in my bonds, right? Remember yeah. me, I could quote it, but maybe you have it memorized. But um, again, just remembering those. Uh, yeah, 13.3. It says, remember the prisoners as if we were chained with them, those who were mistreated, since yourselves are also in this body. Like, I don't know, that verse struck me like, maybe, I don't know, what would we do in that situation, I mm-hmm. guess, is maybe the common question, but I don't know if that's the right question, right? No, it is. I mean, you really <laughs> you really can't have an expectation yeah. of endurance until you're asked to endure. Uh, John Huss, who was murdered, uh, yeah, burned at the stake for standing up uh, uh, for what he believed against, uh, you know, a uh, a religious tribunal. Uh, you know, he would, you know, he tried to hold his hands over the flame of a of a candle, you know, trying to train himself for what he was going to endure, and he realized that he wasn't going to get the grace for that until he got to that place. Um, uh, you know, Richard Wormbrand talks about like you know the the physical, the physical suffering he experienced and how he endured. He you know his hope, his hope, and I guess this you know probably the the soul the souls that he was committed to uh, communicating the gospel to also kept him 
uh, vibrant, uh, you know, vibrant enough to survive this and weather this. And then, uh, you know, others didn't survive. That's yeah. what it tells. He tells this story that some didn't survive. They just perished. They were, and uh, sometimes they were beaten to death in front of people to make, you know, they were trying to, the idea, why was the torture done? The torture was done in order to get information in order to arrest more of these believers. And, uh, you know, the book of Acts talks about this. When Paul is arrested and taken captive, they're stretching him out to beat mm-hmm. him to try and get information. Now, this is a, uh, humans do this to each other. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a wonder to us, but humans do this to each other. They, they push the threshold of pain in order to get information that they can use against others. And this was the whole idea. Uh, Wormbrandt was taken, he was taken to a place his wife didn't know where he was. A few months later, uh, his wife was taken and his son was being indoctrinated uh, as an orphan, you know, and uh, that's part of the book, the, how uh, Mihai uh, stands up for the faith and uh, speaks against uh, the communist atheistic thing and, like, uh, and uh, turning Karl Marx's words into theology. And, the, and the, you know, so how Michael survived is also a part of this. A young man, he was 11 when his mother and father were taken from him. And uh, a couple years, he's living under this sort of indoctrination, and he survives it. Mm. So, uh, you know, uh, that, that's a part of, the, uh, part of the story, of course. Um, uh, well, I don't know why I said that, but <laughs> here well, we he are. he suffered well. I mean, right? He suffered yeah. well. I mean, to, to think, like, again, how would we respond if we had whatever uh, scenario? And I, I like what you said. It's like we, God will give the grace for, for what he has called us to do, I mean, or called us to endure. You know, getting back to this word uh, propaganda, it's, a, it's an interesting word. Um, that's kind of been revised in a lot of ways, but it's. I remember uh, studying this recently. Propaganda is not only the twisting of the truth, but it's to cause the the hearer to be, to question everything and to ultimately believe nothing. Mm-hmm. And I I think that is in our age today. You know, we're seeing uh, the inconsistencies of leaders. We're seeing. Uh, a lot of contradictions, maybe uh, people saying one thing, doing another, and the trust of governments, the trust of even the church in some regards, uh, people not only will doubt what's being said, they will not trust who's saying it. And I think this is really an action of the devil, because if they can bring in an insecurity and a distrust for authority, then again, there is a confusion that comes in and an abstractness. So, I mean, I mean, communism, what, is, what does it do? It strips away creativity. It strips away identity. It takes a full generation, really, for a country to really recover from that. But um, propaganda, what propaganda are we um, influenced by or are we uh, subjected to? It's a good question. It's a good question to check well, ourselves. I think it's language. You know, I mean, propaganda, if we wanted to give like it's language as a utility mm-hmm. as opposed to an expression. And uh, really, like when you talk about propaganda, it it, it involves you know uh, the messaging, uh, the imaging. Everything is like designed to uh, facilitate. You know, these are you know when you when you hear people use these kinds of words, these are social. Uh, you know, uh, what is it? Um, what do we call? What do we call that? <laughs> Memes. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like a, uh, I'm trying to think of that. There's a. Uh, uh, you know, there's a way of like uh, trying to. This is this this usually starts in like sort of a, a classroom setting, academic setting, where you, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the this, the realm of study that it is. I can't remember what it is, but it's not socialism. It's there's another idea, the studying of society. I had to take a class in college on it, and um, you know, you think about social studies. We had yeah. that like, and how how the social how how how, how society operates and that kind of thing and so language can be used uh to uh and we see it we can you if you are aware of it then you can uh, avoid it because it, it starts with like flattery and then uh you know the perpetuating of certain half truths and those lead to you know you know three quarters truths and then you know you get trapped into outright 
outright lies, which mm. is the way uh, the progression of like turning the Jews into the enemies of the uh, German people, which is yeah. what uh, Hitler and his propaganda did. So, uh, you know, you could see that this is, you know, what Richard Wormbrand was a victim of uh, the propaganda. You know, he was the victim of the propaganda. Yeah. And uh, this was, you know, he was, uh, he was not being, and this is what they tried to do is like, you are not believing the messaging that we are sending, so we have to erase you. Yes. And uh, 1984, the novel by George Or Orwell talks about this, like the way that groupthink is one of the words that he invented in there. And this is the whole idea is like we are creating a groupthink through propaganda. Mm. And like if you are not thinking with the group, then you become an enemy of the group and a yes. danger to the group. And so Christians were considered dangerous. And Christians were considered dangerous in the book of Acts to mm -hmm. the religious leaders, and that's why Jesus was crucified, and then also to the Roman Empire. Yes. So uh, Richard Wormbrand is just was another was a chapter in a long legacy of uh, you know the world system, the cosmic system of the devil, uh, attempting attempting to uh, you know attempting to um, erase the message some yeah. way and get the group to think and this, when there's ultimate group think we know that this is the end has come yeah uh, you know the beast thought is crimes, in control right? huh thought crimes yes just any of that just trying to uh yeah sociology well, that's what it's there called. it is sociology <laughs> not biology but sociology there you go i had to take a course in sociology it was really kind of interesting and i've told this story in a couple of places where they uh they took they had a fence they had a fence around a playground for three for third graders, and they played all over the place, swung on the monkey bars, ran to the edge of the fence, and then one day the fence was gone, and without the boundaries, you know, the kids became group, you know, yes. so it's like this is like the society can, you know, and this was a this was a academic experiment that yes. used real third graders, which is like that was the thing that my class was like, what. <laughs> what prompted somebody to do this and use third graders as guinea pigs? Like I love that illustration. I mean, it it again, it's all experimental. But if in a totalitarian government, it, you are programmed how to think and how to act, and and if you don't follow, you're even told what to think. And I think this is what happens after post-communist societies. People want you to tell them how yes. to think, what to do, where to live. And I see that even in our own nation where when we lose our critical thinking skills yes. and someone's telling us what to do and acting for us without really knowing the end of the matter, it's really dangerous. Um, you know, again, in the book, I think of this statement that he says, and I don't think it's actually uh, sourced from him, but blood of the martyrs is the seedbed of the church. Who said that? That's Tertullian. Yeah. That is like early church father. Yeah. Yeah, I again, I just think of what the devil meant for evil to destroy these dear people. I think of the Jews, the the six million, um, I'm sorry, six million Jews in World War II, 20 million Russian Jews, um, that Stalin was a monster, and um, just the paranoia and all of the, the, the horrific history. Some people even say, oh, that didn't even happen. This is, this is where revisionism is so dangerous. It's like, yeah. wow. But this book just keeps our perspective so so clear that um, that we we have a such a uh, valuable Bible and the souls of men are worth more than the whole world and the and the love of God in truth is how we win people. It's true. It's, it's incredible. So that's what we've been trying to talk uh, <laughs> with you about uh, in the area of suffering, persecution, like. What do you need? Like, I, I would suggest that you have some of these books on your bookshelf. Um, I don't know what books you read. Uh, that's what we're here to, that's what, why we had this discussion. It's an important book. Uh, could this happen today? Uh, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is what human beings can do to each other in, in the right context. Um, like I said, uh, With God in Solitary Confinement, it's, uh, it's out there. I recommend it. Uh, another book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, yeah. came out. Uh, uh, That's around amazing. the Puritan era, uh, after the reign of uh, uh, Bloody Mary in England, and many people um, 
were burned at the stake for their faith and for, you know, William Tyndale, in fact, was, um, was burned at the stake and strangled, strangled and burned uh, for producing an English, English version of the New Testament and it was working on the Old Testament too. So, mm. uh, so these are things that, uh, you know, in our faith. And another one, Martyr of the Catacombs, uh, Underground Church really was underground. This is like a novel, but it's like very powerful. And uh, if you can read these kind of things, I think they can, uh, uh, you know, they'll help your heart, stimulate your heart, because the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And yeah. the church grew amazingly underground, and then it became official in the 300s, and that's a church history lesson that we could have on another day. But I want to <laughs> thank Pastor Jason for being a part of the Grace Hour uh, program today. And we want to thank you uh, for watching today. And you can subscribe to the show at YouTube or on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. And uh, we're a ministry of Greater Grace Church in Baltimore. Feel free to join us for church services on Sunday, 9, 11 in the morning, 6.30 in the evening. We also have a midweek service every Wednesday at 7. Thank you for being a part of the Grace Hour listening. Share this. Share this all over the place. Thanks for watching. <laughs>